guys so much for that. Don't you love Because He Lives? Isn't that wonderful? My goodness. Well, it's so good to be here today. If you've been with us, you know that we've been doing uh, studies on uh, the book of Hebrews. And we're finishing up chapter 1 today. And uh, God is good. It's exciting what He's doing in our midst. And uh, I know it's the middle of the summer, the last part of the summer, and and people are on vacation, and we're praying for safety, for travels, and mercies. But God's been good to us this summer. Our, we've seen people baptized a lot, of, a lot of mornings and a lot of evenings, and just seen some good things. But I want to talk to you today out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And the question is this. So, what's the deal with angels? There seems to be this preoccupation with angels. And I uh, shared a little bit last week. I'm going to share a little bit more today. But I want to ask the question, who are angels and what do they do? I mean, obviously the, you read in Scripture over and over and over about God's angels and the angels of God. And uh, what do they do? Well, here's what they do. They're sent to be ministering spirits who serve uh, the Lord and serve us. And there are two different extremes that people go to when they begin thinking about angels or talking about angels, and, and people get really, really far out here. Some have this unhealthy fascination with angels, and uh, others are just ignorant of angels. They really are like, really? There's angels? I mean, there's other beings? Hey, there's a lot of other beings that God's created. So we're going to talk about that today. In honor of the reading of God's Word, I want to ask you to stand. We're going to read verse 13 and verse 14. And here's what it said, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool? Now here's, here's the point. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Who are those who will inherit salvation? Believers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray today that you would open our minds and our hearts as we go through the book of Hebrews, and of course, Lord, you know the theme is looking to Jesus. And Father, everything about what we do in our lives should be focused on Jesus. And Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for what you've done, what you will do, and Lord, what you are doing even in our present midst. We ask, Lord, your will. I pray for attentive eyes, ears, and spirits, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, our culture, the first thing, I want to share a couple of points and a, a few sub-points, but our culture has embraced popular myths about angels. And people say to me often, well, so-and-so became an angel. Is that true? I mean, so-and-so became an angel. Well, we're going to answer that question today. But we've really got our theology on angels, the world has, from TV, movies, and, and uh, just folklore. So I want to talk about the difference at the beginning of this sermon about the difference between folklore and fact about angels. And folklore is what's commonly believed. Fact is what the Word of God says. Now folklore says this. It says angels are people who have died. Fact is the Word of God says angels are spiritual beings created by God. So they're spiritual beings created by God, not people who have died and gone to heaven. Now, I want you to know one of my favorite movies uh, is, uh, it's an old classic, and probably you'll hear me say it every year around Christmas time, and I think everyone should watch it. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. A Wonderful Life, that's my favorite Christmas movie, and it stars Jimmy Stewart, who is one of my favorite actors. But in that movie, if you know anything about it, there's old Clarence. You know, Clarence is an angel wannabe. He's trying to get into heaven to get his wings, and uh, he's not been real successful. He's kind of a bumbling sort of guy, and he's just not really been able to earn it. So he's sent back to earth to help George Bailey recognize how the world would be if he were not there. And in this story, uh, we see this strange concept uh, that is a, co a common belief or for folklore that's believed today. And uh, he's trying to earn his wings by doing enough good deeds, and this is one of those good deeds that might send him over the edge where he can finally get his wings. It is a marvelous movie. 
It is horrible theology. And unfortunately, the theology has often been embraced, even though it's an incredible movie. But people never become angels. Now, one of my favorite uh, writers and authors and preachers, uh, evangelists that's gone on to be with the Lord, was uh, Dr. Billy Graham. And Dr. Graham had uh, his decision magazine, and he would answer these questions. And often in the paper, either he would have a, sp a spot also. And I look back over the years, and I found this because I remember him saying something about angels. I read his book, Angels, 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 God's Secret Angels. But here was the question that was asked him. Dear Dr. Graham, my sister lost her small son a little over a year ago, and on the anniversary of his death, she put a poem in the paper to remind him, to remember him. It said something about being an angel now. Is that what happens to us when we die and go to heaven, that we become angels? And it's signed, Miss L.C. He said, Dear Miss L.C., I know your sister was sincere, and I respect her sorrow and her desire to remember and honor your son, but no. We don't become angels when we die and go to heaven. The truth is, when we die and go to heaven, we become even greater than the angels. The angels are spiritual beings created by God to be His servants, and God has given them the great authority and power to do His will. And at the present time, the angels are greater than we are because God made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, Psalm 8, 5, but the Bible also says that in heaven we will be, a high, we will be higher than the angels and the reason is because we will be like Christ. The Bible says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6, 3. All of that, I know, may seem like theological hair splitting to you, but don't lose sight of the central truth. When we know Christ, we know that life, this life is not all, but ahead of us is the joy of heaven. May your sister take comfort in this truth and in the fact that her little son is now beyond all pain and suffering of this world. Now, that is the, the truth about angels. Angels are not your children or our grandparents or our parents that have gone to heaven and become angels. Now, to finish up that story, because many of you remember It's a Wonderful Life. At the very end, George Bailey's there. Everybody's coming into his house. They're standing by the Christmas tree, and the house is dilapidated because he's been so good to the community, not taking care of his own things. And there he is, they're bringing money, and, and all of a sudden, a bell rings on the Christmas tree. And there's his little daughter. And his little daughter says something like this. Teacher says that every time there's a bell that rings, an angel gets its wings. How many remember that line? Well, that's, that's emblazoned in people's minds and their hearts, so they think, well, that's what transpires. But that's not true. Now, I want to share something with you. If you've had a child die, a very small child, and you're wondering, what happened to my child? What, will I ever see my child again? Well, I have great news for you. Second Samuel tells us in chapter 12 and verse number 23, it says, talking about King David, King David then mourning for his son had been sick, and he said, but now he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. You know what he was saying? I will go and I will be with my son and I will see him again. Not as an angel, but as my son. So what we need to do is hang our hope not upon becoming angels, but recognizing the fact that God saved us and gave us hope of heaven. And once we get to heaven, we will be greater than the angels. That's the truth of the Word of God. So if you are a believer, take great courage and confidence in knowing this. God has a place for you in heaven, and you will not be an angel. You will be much more. People ask me too, they say, Brother John, what age will my child be because they died at a young age when they get to heaven? Well, if you've got your, your pencil and your paper out, I'm going to give you the age, okay? This is the age that they will be. The perfect age. The perfect age. Because God does everything well. And He knows even before we do what will transpire and before the foundations of the earth and the creation, God had it all Scripted. Now listen, the second folklore that I want to share with you is this. Angels are chubby babies with wings. <laughs> and often they're on a cloud with a harp. 
But the fact is, angels often appear, and I, I really had trouble selecting the correct wording here, so don't, don't get on to me about this word, ordinary men. They often appear as ordinary men. But that's what I mean. They're, they don't stand out is what I'm saying. They, they, they often appear as just ordinary men in Scripture. That's how the angels appear. Now, how many of you have ever bought something for your sweetheart on for February 14th, Valentine's Day? Just be honest with me, guys. How many have done that? Well, there's a few honest men. The rest of you, you need, you need to get with the program. But how many of you have ever seen that picture of Cupid with the bow drawn, there it is, and shooting an arrow into the hearts of lovers that they may love one another? Well, I want you to understand something. There are many ways that we depict angels, but very, very few of those are true because we have a tendency to fashion them after Cupid. But in the Bible, angels don't look like that. They're often portrayed as men wearing brilliant white garments as they are coming into relationship with other people and communicating with other people. Now, there are two heavenly angels that I know, two groups, that have wings. The other groups were not told that they have wings or don't have wings. But in Isaiah 6, if you want to go back and read that sometimes, it's a seraphim. And the seraphim have six wings. And, and they're hovering above the, the, uh, the, the throne of God. And they're, they're there. Can you imagine the sound of, of, of all of these angels with these fluttering wings? I mean, it would almost be thunderous in nature. But there they are. And not only the seraphim, but they're also the cherubim. And the cherubim, we have in Exodus chapter 10, and they are, we're told that they have four wings. So we have six and we have four, but those are the only two angels we're told have wings. We're not told that any other angels that God created have wings. But many popular depictions show them to have wings. But the Word of God doesn't show that at all. They come as ordinary men when they approach people. Now there's two categories as we think about this, and, and I, I want you to understand something. As we look at both of these categories uh, of, of angels, I want you to think with me for just a moment. When in Genesis chapter 3, the first mentioning that we have of an angel, what is it? It's an angel at the, at the edge of the garden, at the entrance of the garden, because Adam and Eve had sinned, they'd been expelled, and that angel has a flaming, fiery sword that they cannot enter into heaven again. So that's how we see angels. Abraham encountered an angel. And Abraham, when he encountered, he encountered these three angels... They looked like men. He didn't recognize the fact that they weren't men until after they were gone. In Judges chapter 13, an angel appeared to Manoah, and when that angel appeared, he thinks that he wants to cook him something so he can eat. But here's the truth, guys. Think about this with me. How many of you have seen angels? Now, be careful. Don't respond. You ever think about that? Because Hebrews tells us later that many of them have attended angels or they have entertained angels unaware. You ever done that, you think? Uh, you know, I thought a lot about this. And, and Sandy and I, we were with some of the other church members here. We were in Jacksonville, Florida. we just come out of the worship center with 10,000 people worshiping God. We had a 300-member choir, a 100-piece orchestra, and all of these voices and, and the worship leaders. And we came out of there, and we were all just, I mean, hair standing on, our, on, on stems. And Betty, you probably remember this. We came out, and we were walking down the streets. We were walking down the street, 10,000 of us going here and there. And there was a beggar here. And he was asking for help. And we all just walked by him. And I probably walked five or six paces, and I had to stop. And I thought, how horrible to be in the very presence of God, worshiping, then come out and walk right by one of his creations. So I turned around, and I was just going to go talk to him and see if I needed anything or what I could help him with. And guess what? I'd taken one, two, three, four, five. The other end of the street was way down there, and he was gone. I've often wondered, did God place him there as a test for us? I don't know. Could have been a man. Could have been an angel. I don't know. But since that time, the last 20, almost 20 years, that has bothered me. That has bothered me. Did I walk by 
an angel. And I I won't know that this side of heaven, but when I get to heaven, God may say, you know what? You failed that test. (laughs) And you know what? It's always good to be kind to others, and it's always good. Listen to me, and I know some people, they're scam artists, but I want you to understand something. We never know what that person has gone through or is going through. So do not be too critical or judgmental. I would rather err on the side of giving and helping. You say, well, they may go liquor, buy liquor. That's not my deal. My deal was to extend help. That's what we're responsible for. So I don't know if, if that was real or that was my imagination or what that was. But listen, angels often appear as ordinary men. Folklore number three, angels are sweet creatures who play harps. Fact. They are mighty warriors who wield swords. Now you think about this. I I gave you a little uh, preempt to this. But there in the Garden of Eden, what do you see? There's that angel with a flaming sword of fire. You can't go back in. In Joshua chapter 5, they're about to go into the promised land. And Joshua's out walking. He can't sleep. And he encounters an angel and he said, Whose side are you on me? Our side or the other side? He said, I'm not on any side. I'm on my own side. I didn't come to take part. I came to take over. And you see, that's what happens with angels. I mean, the power that's there. And in fact, in Joshua 5.14, we'll just look at that text of Scripture. No, but the commander of the army of the Lord, as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua then, what did he do? He fell on his face and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord God say to his servant? In other words, what am I to do? Now that angel came as a mighty warrior of Almighty God. Maybe you remember the story of Elisha and his servant. And uh, they're they're surrounded by the army. And and the servant thinks they're going to perish. Gehazi said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, look in the hills. Look around you. We outnumber them. He said, oh, I can't see anything. So he said, Lord, remove the scales from his eyes that he may see. And then he saw all of the angels and mighty warriors of God. And then peace came over him. And I want you to understand something. We have probably been protected in a multitude of ways that we'll never be aware of this side of heaven. God has provided for our safety. Now you remember something else. On the way to the cross, Jesus told Peter he could call 12 legions of angels to rescue him. That's 72,000 angels. Now think about this. You go back into the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 35, one angel one night slew 185,000 Syrian warriors. If one angel could do that, you know what I think God, what Jesus was saying? Listen, I, he, I could send all the angels. They could wipe everything out, wipe the slate clean that quick. But that's not how God chose to do. He chose to save, and He chose to forgive. And you know what? We're incredibly blessed because of that. Second point, that's fact, that's folklore. Second point about this text is this. Angels were active during the life of Jesus, during his ministry. Now, you think about that, and you go back, and there was Gabriel, and Gabriel was making the announcement to Mary that she was going to give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. Angels were there uh, with Joseph, and Joseph, you're going to marry Mary. Don't be afraid to take her as your spouse wife. Go ahead and follow through, and you think about Jesus' life. The angels were there from his birth through the empty tomb, and his ascension back to heaven. I mean, they were there in every single case. Remember, they in his birth, they appeared to shepherds outside of Jerusalem, were tending their flocks at night, and they announced a new king is here. Remember that? Remember when uh, Herod was going to kill him, and the angel came in the middle of the night and told Joseph, take your son and your wife and go down into Egypt? And then after they'd been in the... In, in Egypt long enough, an angel came and said, Hey, the coast is clear. Head back to Nazareth. Remember when Jesus was fasting? As he, he, he was early ministry when, when he, he got baptized and he went into the wilderness. And he's there in the wilderness. He fasts 40 days and 40 nights. And then 
He, the temptations come from Satan, and then he says, Away with you, Satan. In Matthew chapter 4, 4, chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, these words are said. Jesus said, Away with you, Satan. It's written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him you shall serve. Then the devil left him. Now, here's what I want you to see. And behold, angels came and attended to him. Now, that is the same word in the Greek text that's used in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, and it means they came and ministered to him with food. Now, they come I mean, think about it. You're, you're hungry 40 days, 40 nights you haven't eaten? I'm going to be pretty hungry. Hard to go four hours without eating. I don't know that I would have made it that long. Four hours, that's a long time. So you think about it. There in Gethsemane, the angels came and ministered to Jesus when he was sweating great drops of blood. The angels also rolled away the stone not to let Jesus out, but we could look in and see that he is risen. He is not here just as he promised he would be. And then the angels are there declaring as the apostles and believers are looking into heaven, staring into heaven, this same Jesus, they said in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, will come again. As he goes into heaven, he's going to come again. But who told them that? Two angels. Hey, it's okay. He's coming back. So I want you to understand that. Third thing I want you to get is this, and then we've got a couple sub points, and then I'm going to wrap it up. You know, angels de deliver common messages to God's people. That's what they do. They deliver common messages. And for the fact, the word angelos means messenger. They are God's messengers to deliver to us what we need. So what do they deliver to us? What, what, what's the, and and I, I've gone through, and I have looked at multiple accounts, and, and I've, I've summarized that and brought it down to three things. Now, they say a lot more, but three common things angels say when they come and visit with men. You want to know what they are? Number one, scared. Are you scared? <laughs> Don't you love out of the mouth of children? Of course you're not scared. You're in the middle of church. But if you're ever scared, here's what angels are telling you. Cheer up. Cheer up. Praise God. Amen. Cheer up. That's the most common uh, words that angels speak to people. And uh, what they usually say is not cheer up, but they use this, this three-letter word, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Now, now, bring it down. Think about this with me. As human beings, we fear. We fear, don't we? The unknown, we fear. Our death, we fear. Not because of unbelief but how we're going to die we fear we fear losing jobs we fear losing mates we fear not having enough money for the month we fear but the angels most common words to God's people is fear not when Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said to her, Do not be afraid. The angel said to Joseph in a dream, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The angel told Paul in Acts chapter 27, when it appeared that the ship they were on was going to perish in every soul there, and to go out and tell all of the crew and all of those on this ship that not a soul will perish. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Cheer up. It's not over. But I read the paper this morning. And with terrorist attacks, with the governments being overthrown, with the stock market so high you know it has to come down, with the housing, it seems like there's going to be possibly another crisis. All of these things start to make us fear. And then we read in there of a, a man from a police department in a neighboring county, two, two counties over, shot doing his job. Brings fear. Brings fear. I told the other day, I've, I've lived at the end of this road forever, and this is the first time I've ever been robbed. Fear. Fear. 
getting bad news from our medical physician. Brings fear. Brings fear. It brings fear. But I want you to hear something. Jeremiah 29. If you're a believer and a follower in Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this. The Lord told Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. So I want to share something with you that are struggling, that are going through some bad times and having some difficulties. Hang on to that last word, hope. Having only positive expectations. Hang on to it. Don't throw the towel in. Don't give up. Don't say, I can't do it. Don't say, this is it. We don't know. Secondly, sleeping, wake up. Sleeping, wake up. It's time to wake up. This is the third thing that we, our second thing that we see. And on many occasions, we've seen an angel waking a person up. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was asleep in a prison. The angel comes in, says, wake up, actually has to poke him in the ribs to get him to wake up. So ladies, I have something for you. If your husband likes to sleep in church, you'll never be more angelic than when you poke him in the ribs. <laughs> wake him up. Sleeping, wake up. Think about Elijah. Elijah was exhausted. Elijah was depressed and he wanted to die. And he fell asleep and God sent an angel to wake him up and said, eat, your journey is long. It's time to wake up. Now I want you to hear something. Think about this. We need to wake up in a lot of ways, guys. We really do. Our world is changing faster than we ever imagined possible. Things that are being embraced now would have never been embraced 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we're just saying it's all, everything's good. Everything's good. People are saying things. Politicians, and I'm not going to get political, but I want you to hear this. Politicians on both sides of the aisle and even our president is, are saying things that should never be uttered. It is disgraceful. It's time that we wake up and we find our moral balance. You read the book of Proverbs. It says that we should guard our tongue. You come to the book of James. It says that the tongue is set on fire by hell. We need once again to sometimes hold our thoughts to ourselves and keep our mouth Now you think about this. It's time to wake up. Ever, ever been driving down the road? You, you've been, I mean, you, you, you've been on the road a long time and, and you start to nod off and it's all, almost like you hear something some say, wake up! Wake up! That's what we need to do. Thirdly, silent. The angels say, speak up. That's the third most common message I have found from Scripture. Now, here's the reason we should speak up, because angels aren't evangelists. You know why? Because they've never been lost. They don't know what it's like to be lost. God didn't send His Son to redeem angels, but mankind. 1 Peter 1, 12. To them, it was not revealed. It wasn't revealed to them. But to us, they were ministering the things which they... Now, which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into, but they cannot understand what salvation truly is. Angels don't share the gospel. People share the gospel. That is our job. But many times, listen to me, many times angels have directed people to share their faith. In Acts chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, it said that they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison, but at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, now you need to go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. In other words, you need to go preach the gospel. Do it now. An angel in Acts chapter 8 told Philip to go catch that Ethiopian eunuch and explain to him what it said and he caught him and he explained it to him and the Ethiopian eunuch said well I, I, what, what hinders me now that I believe from being baptized he said you believe now be baptized and he was 
pastor was uh, going to visit a family who had visited the church and requested a visit. Knocked on the door, and the man and his wife were not home. So, a little discouraged, they started walking back toward the car. But there was a man sitting on a porch swing in the house between and said, the other house right on the other side of me, they need a visit. So they, preacher and one of the deacons, went over there and knocked on the door. And this elderly couple came to the door. They said, listen, we're just out making visits, and we'd come to visit a neighbor, but he's not home, so we decided we would visit you. And they talked about small talk, about life, and about things that interested the man and his wife. And then the pastor said, can I ask you an important question? He said, well, sure you can. He said, if you were to die today and stand before God, what would you say when he said, why should I let you into my heaven? And the man said, I don't have any idea what I would say. He said, I want you to know something. The other night I was praying, and I was praying that God would send someone to me to tell me how to get right with God because I was just diagnosed with cancer. It doesn't appear that I'm going to live. And he shared with that man faith, how to trust Christ, and that man did. And then as the pastor and the deacon were going to leave, he said, Pastor, who told you to come to my house? Oh, he said, well, your neighbor told me to come. He was sitting on the porch. He said, Pastor, that house has been empty for two months. Was that an angel? I don't know. Was it just somebody sitting on the porch? I don't know. But I want you to know something. Angels are real, and they are sent as ministering spirits to those who inherit salvation, the believer. Now listen to me. We need to believe in angels, but listen to me. We need to trust in Jesus. Because they're here to point us to Jesus, to do His bidding. So let me ask you a question. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. Has there ever been a time in your life that you truly set down that spike of life and said, here's where I stand. I give my heart, my life, my soul, my future, my all to Jesus Christ. Has there ever been a time when you've done that and said, Lord, forgive me, save me. I repent of my sins. I turn to you. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and His completed work. Lord, I give my life to you. Now listen, if, there, if you have done that, praise God, amen, and you needed to be baptized. You have not been baptized. You need to be baptized. But here's the thing. If you have never done that, when you get to heaven, why should I let you in? That bit's a great white throne judgment, actually. Why should I let you in? My heaven, you won't have anything to say. Because it won't matter how many good deeds you've done. It won't matter that you tried to keep the Ten Commandments. It won't matter that you were kind to your neighbor. The only thing that matters when you get to that point is, what have you done with my son? And if you've never given your life to Christ, today is the opportunity to do that. We, it's called an invitation. Our worship team is going to sing, I Surrender All. And I'm going to ask some of you today who have never surrendered all to surrender all. Listen. Not a game. This is a lie. You get one shot at it, and when you are gone, it's over. What you do in this life for Christ is the only thing that matters eternally. Heavenly Father, I pray that you touch hearts and lives. You transform us. Lord, I pray that those who are believers would be strong. They would stand up. They would speak up. Lord, I, I pray for others who need to give their heart and life to you. And I thank you, Father, you've given us divine protection with your messengers, the angels. And I pray now, Lord, for your perfect will. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and come to
finish chapter 2 next week, and we'll be talking about drifting. And I want you to know, too many are drifting. You have to be focused in your life. And that means you have to constantly look at Jesus. If you get your eyes on all these other things, guess what? Just like a log going down the river, you're drifting. It's time to turn and go against the current and live what we say we believe. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. And I pray you'll come back tonight. We're having the Lord's Supper. And it takes about 20 minutes. That's all we do is focus on the Lord's Supper. Be here tonight. If you've not taken the Lord's Supper since you've been saved, or you haven't taken it in a long time, I challenge you to come. It is one of the most wonderful services that you'll experience. God bless you. Tom dismisses. Father, we heard your word this morning. And God, uh, you send your angels to us. They serve you. And God, they work at your command. I thank you, Lord, for the instruction that Brother John has given to us today. I pray, God, we would take this to heart. I pray, Father, that as we leave today, that we would <coughs> seek to know you better, that we would serve you better, that we'd be faithful in all things. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.